We're live. <laughs> We're live. Hello. Hi everyone. How's it going? Welcome to the Crossworlds Camping Masterclass. Mm -hmm. We are Josh. I'm Sarah. Hello. Uh, so we are the founders of Veggie Vagabonds, which is a ethical adventure website. Hello guys. Nice to have you with us. We are um, massive outdoor lovers. Yeah. We are uh, Van Gogh ambassadors. Yep, Van Gogh tent ambassadors. And we're going to be talking to you today. Can you see me properly? Uh, we're going to be talking to you today about sustainable camping, which yeah. is um, the best time to be doing it because in two weeks we're going to be back out in the wild in our tents. Woohoo! Uh, so, yeah, we're going to be sharing lots of tips to um, how you can. Do it and do it a bit more sustainably. Embrace the time outside and do it with a lower impact, which is really important. Yeah. Um, so to start off with, I will warn you that whilst we are outdoor fanatics, fanatics, maybe not pros, but we are um, we know stuff outdoors. We plan trips. We climb. Um, we are not tech people. No. So uh, if we turn into kind of glitchy robots, if you can't hear us, we go bright green. Um, please tell us. Okay. Yeah, and we'll try and fix it as best we can. <laughs> cool. So uh, thank you for joining us. We are talking to you from our living room. Uh, we do have a garden, but we also have a very friendly, um, a very friendly neighbour who may or may not uh, try and get involved. Yes. Yeah. So we thought talking. Um, the living room might be better. Uh, you don't want to see the rest of the house because it has now gone everywhere else in quite a kerfuffle. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. Uh, where is where are you guys joining us from? <laughs> Any shout outs? No. Okay. <laughs> we're in North Yorkshire. North moment. Yorkshire. Yeah. So as Josh said, we're sort of outdoor enthusiasts, so we enjoy a lot of camping, hiking, climbing, cycling, spending as much time as we can outdoors. We find it very inspiring. And it's where we feel most at home, really. Yeah, just as, uh, as much time outside as possible. Mm -hmm. really. So we've been on recent trips, sort of cycling around where we live, trying out some new dehydrated recipes, hiking. So yeah, and prior to the coronavirus, we were a thousand miles into a England to India cycle tour. Um, we, yeah. Go on. Well, so yes, yeah, so we, we got a thousand, we had planned this tour for... Um, a long time it was, six, it was meant to be six and a half thousand miles from mm -hmm. england to india uh we were gonna we had gone through starting in france yeah um and then around this what well, about christmas time last year we um the coronavirus struck when we were a thousand miles into the tour yeah so we had originally been planning to leave our base we had been based sort of in the alps where we were spending a lot of time exploring all of the mountains there we were doing a lot of wild camping a lot of hiking um, but we had planned to leave and sort of cycle through northern Italy, but the coronavirus sort of put a spanner in the works and we had to uproot and come back to the UK, which in itself was a bit of an adventure because yeah. we had to dismantle and post our bikes home along with all of our gear, which was a bit of a nightmare. And then we have chosen not to fly, so we were trying to get back sort of overland even a, a short buses. a short distance but trying to kind of piece together six or seven different trains yeah, at, the, uh, <laughs> at the start of the lockdown um was this is when awful. everything was getting cancelled it seemed like the world was gonna end mm. yeah but we managed to get back thankfully and we came back to cambridge which is our hometown yes but if you know cambridge at all it has its um quirks but in terms of outdoors, it's probably the most uninspiring place. The, the furthest the place, apart from the Cotswolds shop in Cambridge, that's about the most adventurous thing in the whole of the city. I think yeah. the, the closest climbing area is, they've got a climbing gym, mm. but the, the closest, I think we've got a hill, which is about 100 metres above <laughs> sea level. Yeah, it's very flat. Um, yeah. So then as soon as we got back, we knew we had to uh, make it a priority to move somewhere. Mm -hmm. where we could uh, be outside in the green so we uprooted ourselves and came here to north yorkshire where we're a lot happier it's a lot greener we're able to do a lot more outdoors hiking swimming cycling yeah, yeah. got some great climbing spots within a cycling distance yeah, which, which is um which is beautiful yeah like malham Gordoscar, yeah. yeah and um crook rise glasby yeah and i think that whole um and so we're we're loving our time here and then we're kind of waiting until we can get back on our bikes and get pedaling back towards india 
Um, mm. Even though, the, so the first, so I said the whole thing was going to be about six and a half thousand miles, and we thought it would all take us eighteen months, roughly. Yeah, but we spent about the, well, we spent a year in in France. In France. Uh, it took ten us... months of that in the Alps, just because it was so beautiful. We just got stuck. We just wanted to explore. Mm. <laughs> when I think when there's so much around you, it just seemed. And we knew that there were so much more interesting things to explore, but we just thought it was crazy to go past it and not, yeah, and and not and embrace it. Mm -hmm. And we also spent two months climbing Fontainebleau, yeah. uh, and then moved to the Alps where we were hiking and climbing and cycling. Um, yeah. But yeah, but you yeah. get to sort of get back on our bikes again and sort of keep exploring when Yeah, and I, th I think this, like, these trips were inspired by um, our want to make our time outdoors a bit more sustainable. Yeah, right? so this is where the idea of cycling all the way from here around the world sort of came from. So from our travels, we saw a lot of environmental destruction. We saw a lot of coastlines being eroded. We saw a lot of litter. And it was really this that inspired us to try and put a more sustainable ethos on our lives and our time spent outdoors, because it was being in these places and seeing all this destruction it really made us want to protect them because we enjoyed them so much and we wanted other people to be able to enjoy them as well and um i think when we had that change to try and make our like outdoor pursuits more sustainable it actually um it turned things completely on its head but in yeah. such a good way it really made um it made it much more of an adventure yeah, it really did um and we'll tell you a bit more about yeah. those afterwards and i guess that's what inspired us to create Veggie Vagabonds, which is uh, a place where we share sustainable outdoor tips mm -hmm. with uh, a big emphasis on helping people get outside and having a lower impact with lots yeah. of like sustainable gear reviews and mm -hmm. we share things like vegan sustainable recipes. Sustainable guide, yeah, vegan recipes, yeah. Um, and so we're really, really stoked to be talking to you today about mm -hmm. camping because I'm assuming if you're here, you're camping lovers like us. Um, and Jimmy, it's just the best, if you want to be in nature, it's the best way to do it. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you turn a multi-day trip, a hike, a, uh, sorry, turn a, a day trip or a cycle, turn it into a multi-day thing. You get yeah. further and further and further into the world. Yeah. Whether you're wild camping or whether you're in campsites, it's just, you know, you, you fall asleep with the sound of birds and you wake up with a, like a camp stove, have your coffee in the morning and then you just wake up to this beautiful natural yeah, setting. It's one of the best ways to like really explore and take in the outdoors. But we probably don't need to tell you that because no. you're <laughs> listening in. Um, but whilst you're in these places, it's it's so important, you know, you're in these really naturally pristine areas. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to be um, thinking about how you're going into them and trying to do it with as, as little an impact as possible. Yeah. Uh, and I guess so that's what we're going to talk to you about today. Yeah, so we're going to share sort of some sustainable tips that hopefully will inspire you to incorporate them into your next camping trips outdoors. But I guess the most important thing to remember is that it's not all or nothing we're going to share quite a few tips with you and it's not about trying to do all of them i mean if you can that's great but it's really about sort of doing it bit by bit it's not all or nothing and it's important to remember that this is sort of a gradual process sort of incorporating these things to make yeah. your trips more sustainable and it can often make them a bit cheaper and definitely make them a bit more of an adventure yeah, so it's about enhancing rather than sort of taking away but it really it really can it can save you money and mm -hmm. it can turn kind of trips if you think of them slightly differently it can turn them into these huge big adventures yeah um, and yeah and like sarah said i think the sustainable ish thing is really important but i think trying to do it all at one point is going to be uh, it's going to be difficult and it can be a bit uh, overwhelming and feel a little bit like a mountain to climb it's yeah so um take on the tips do them one by one to see what works for you and then you can build on that and yeah. if you've got any other questions uh just put them through here i yeah, have to fire them at us we'll look forward to, a bit to read them. But yeah we'll try and uh, answer as much as we can mm -hmm. cool so without further ado we'll get on to the first thing which is planning i think we've got a delivery at the door no <laughs> uh so yeah the the three i think the best way to split it up is to think about what you're doing before you go on your trip what you do on your trip and what you do after, after. your trip mm -hmm. so that's how we're going to break down the tips as well so before your trip it doesn't maybe seem like you know your environmental impact will change from what you do beforehand but this is actually probably one of the most important things in terms of like the bigger the bigger picture so um with planning the first thing you can think about and also with planning it doesn't have to take very long honestly mm -hmm. if you spend like 15 20 minutes half an hour you can get it all done 
and uh, you really will have, there's like there's so many benefits to it it's really worth doing mm -hmm. um, so the first thing is thinking about where you're going and when you're going mm -hmm. um, so obviously you know we live in a place where it's really naturally beautiful and there's lots of places where they're incredibly popular and they experience particularly in the summer like the summer months and the holidays weekends bank holidays <coughs> they get really really busy and um Places like Snowdon, places like the lakes, very, very popular. And it, obviously it's because they're incredible, but there are loads of other places as well, which aren't maybe as well known. Um, they're equally, equally stunning. Equally amazing. Mm -hmm. So I think the first big thing is try like think about exploring alternative destinations. And this really can make your trip so much more exciting because you've already, with a lot of these places that are very well traveled, you've probably seen photos, heard stories, you've got a lot of already preconceived ideas if you find these new places mm, off the beaten track hidden gems it's just uh, you know it's a whole new adventure to you and you can make it your own and mm -hmm. obviously you've got that side but you're also not going to be contributing to some places where it can you know a lot of these places are overstrained you know yeah. a lot of, particularly these wild camping spots where you know they're going to be popular as soon as the craft comes around so you can maybe think about exploring alternative places so instead of north wales and snowdon go to south wales south wales is incredible and you have half the amount of footfall there instead of the lakes you could go like northeast to northumberland mm -hmm. or even if instead of ben nevis you could go up into the cairngorms or into the, the further north monrose mm -hmm. and you will have an incredible time honestly you will it won't make anything harder you can just have less people around you and you're not going to be um yeah, I guess. Contributing to all the strain that these places are sometimes put on with the huge amount of footfall that they receive. It puts a strain on the natural environment and also the infrastructure. And that's not to say never go to them. Obviously, like, you know, everyone, you know the lakes are incredible for a reason. Mm. It just means, think, you know, maybe think about sometimes going to them and then also sometimes picking an alternative destination. Yeah, because these very popular places, especially at popular times of year, sort of in school holidays in the peak of summer, they're going to be experiencing a lot of people. So I think you're going perhaps in the off season or the shoulder season to these more popular places will just reduce the strain on these environments. And um, another thing to think about is what definitely agree with finding new places. Some of my best adventures are finding hidden gems. Hey, Sussex Sarah, where are these hidden, what, what hidden gems? <laughs> or do you want to keep them a secret? Yeah. Um, another thing to think about is the wildlife so this is when you're planning your trip so you've got around the uk we're fortunate to have lots of beautiful wildlife uh, and things like mating seasons it is something to think about so for example you have like deer like deer ruttings like in the cairngorms mm -hmm. really famous deer ruttings loads of like mating season and obviously this is an incredible thing to see yeah. um but planning a wild trip a uh, wild camping trip through these areas whilst you have all these um big male deer um you know it might not be the best, might not be the best idea not only is it probably going to distract them from finding their mate you're probably going to have a, a horny deer um, <laughs> inspecting your tent which is not what you want no um so yeah. yeah having a bit of consideration for where you're going and what time of year can massively reduce the impact of your trip on these places and then the, the next thing is your gear. And yeah. this is something I'm really kind of personally very, very interested in. Um, I think maybe a gear fanatic is like borderline, maybe. But um, so this is a really huge thing because for camping, you do need, you, you know, you do need lots of equipment. Um, and these things can have, uh, producing them has a big, you know, it, it uses a lot of resources. So you need to pick your gear wisely. Mm -hmm. And I think the main thing with that is to see it as an investment. So for things like your tent, this is your home. You, you know, yeah. when you're when you're going into the wild, this is a thing that's going to keep you safe. Your clothes are going to keep you warm. Your food is going to keep you nourished. You really need to think about picking the best thing for you. And mm -hmm. when you say best, it doesn't have to be more expensive at all. No, it depends on your, the type of trip. So, for example, you don't want to be taking a four season tent in the peak of summer somewhere in the UK is just not going yeah. to be necessary. Or if you're going to be camping up on the Monroes in winter. You don't want a super lightweight tent. Yeah, or a pop-up tent maybe isn't going to cut it. So mm -hmm. I think the um, thinking about the gear that you're going to get and putting a bit of, you know, it might take an extra afternoon of researching, but uh, find the best gear for you. Mm -hmm. And if you go places like Cotswold stores, once they're open again, it is a great way to, you know, you can speak and you can get advice and you can get the perfect thing for your trip. Mm -hmm. and, and they're also offering the chance to speak to staff online as well at the moment. 
and, and this will definitely save you money as well because um, you know if you get the wrong thing and use it for the wrong activities it's, it's not going to last no um, and you'll end up just having to fork out for more and it will contribute to all your fleece going to land on if it's not exactly what you needed i can't can you hear us okay, okay. You, you got us okay <laughs> um yeah so see it as an investment and it, and it will last mm -hmm. um and so you also, if you can, you want to be looking for sustainable brands and yeah. sustainable products. And obviously this is like a really big, big thing and it can be quite hard to know what is a sustainable brand or a sustainable product. But nowadays on the Cotswolds website, they've got search functions if you're shopping online where you can see the sustainability of the product. And this mm -hmm. is a really useful way to be able to find brands like, uh, so for example, like Patagonia, Mm -hmm. They um, Very a, good. a B Corp company like really really do a lot of things to put uh, money back into the environment and mm -hmm. to be making sure their products are produced sustainably. Like I think this top is, it's almost all recycled materials. Yeah. Um, Which is incredible that they're able to take all of this old gear and give it a new lease of life. It's amazing. And you can you can see that easily on the uh, on the website, which is it makes it so much easier. You know, five years ago that wasn't possible. Now we can see. The products which are going to have a lower carbon footprint mm. for things like tents um a good thing so on the outside of tents you have a, a water proofing so dwr which is durable water repellency and some tents use a chemical called pfc to make that happen which is not a very good chemical for mm. the environment and again you can see this online you can see the tents which are pfc free mm. and other camping brands like Van Gogh, who we ambassador for, they've got their Earthline, which uses lots of uh, recycled materials. Mm -hmm. And they've also got lots where you can get secondhand gear too. So I think picking these things will really, slowly, it will, you know, it really does add up and makes quite a big difference. Yeah, it does. It really can reduce the impact of your trip. Another big thing to... Oh, one more thing with... Oh, uh, sorry, no? I jump in. One more thing with tents. Um, so investing in a tent footprint so oh, this is a it's an additional buy but they only cost maybe 15 or 20 pounds and it's a piece of material that you will put underneath your tent and this can really like for 10 or 15 pounds it will really make it last so much longer from the the chafing on the floor mm -hmm. um so do you mean that will see your tent's your home and yes. you know they are expensive it's <laughs> a kit and a footprint can make it last so much longer. So it's definitely worth picking up a footprint for your tent. Mm, yeah, these small pur purchases can make things like your tent, big bits of equipment last so much longer. And the next thing to think about is food and drink. So we like to make a lot of food before we go on our trip because this massively reduces the amount of waste that we have on the trail. So we all will home make sort of snacks and dehydrated meals. Obviously, this isn't always possible, especially if you're on a longer trip. You're going to need to pick up supplies along the way so thinking about buying things that are locally sourced locally made buying things in season trying to avoid sort of single use plastic wrapped products will massively massively reduce the carbon footprint of your trip yeah another thing that we invested in that was definitely worth it is a water filter so this will stop you having to go off the trail and buy water from supermarkets or fill up at places you can just filter the water on the trail and drink it straight away it will hugely reduce your use of plastic and also it can be a lifesaver because there's loads yes. of time especially if you're if you're wild camping in remote areas you know you're not going to find a little uh, convenience store to pick no. up water so this you can go straight from the stream and there's something very kind of like primitive and nice feeling yeah, about drinking but... straight from the stream as well mm. um, also if you are buying food you may need to buy sort of dehydrated meals for sort of longer trips Firepot are a really good one because they have sustainable packaging. You can also get other brands as well that use recyclable and compostable packaging, which again is a huge way to just reduce the impact of your trip. Yeah, so I think because you know not everyone is going to want to cook, so that's a good way to do it. And mm. if you are wanting to cook, I think have a bit of fun with it. You know, explore, you know, try different recipes. If you want some plant-based recipes, you can check them out on our website. There's mm. loads of things like kind of energy balls are so good just to be able to eat on the go or you know, dehydrating your own foods or... Mm -hmm. um... And also trying to eat a bit more plant-based. So we are vegan and the reason we chose it is because it is a greener way to eat. So if you can incorporate more plant-based meals into your diet whilst in the outdoors, it will just reduce that impact even yeah. further. It doesn't mean to completely stop eating meat. Yeah. It just means that kind of think about just Perhaps having... a little bit less. Yeah. 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 And I guess that the next point 
is transport mm -hmm. and this is something which we uh, always carry water purification tablets yeah. yeah yeah this is also good yeah water purifying you can get like the steri pen you can get purification tablets you can we get, use the soya squeeze as well yeah mm -hmm. water filter bottles mm -hmm. um, or you can you can boil it but I guess it uses lots of gas it's probably it's definitely it's not the best way not, not yeah. the quickest um, yeah um, but yeah so transport this is something which can turn something into a huge adventure yes. um, so obviously we, we live in England, well a lot of us live in England or the UK, or the UK. <laughs> um, and we are so we have such a good public transport network. Yeah, so, buses, trains, it's incredible. Having travelled the world we can definitely say, although sometimes they're a bit late, that it is very well connected. Yeah, and although I get, if especially if you're going to be, um, you've got lots of camping gear, it, it's definitely easier it can be easier to go in a car yeah so if you are going to drive i think you should think about trying to fill your car up i know it's during covid now but if you can lift share think for the future lift sharing is a really is a very interesting way to meet different people or share your car so you can fill up your car mm. or you can go with other people and you will meet some really interesting we've, people we've met some very interesting locals when we've been traveling by then picking us up and taking us to places and they've given us some of the best recommendations because these are people that know the local area if we tell them that we're hiking from a to b they might tell us oh don't go this way go this way it's so much better you can do so much more taking an alternative route and these are these are people that are locals they're experts in the area yeah so i think for like for things like wild camping tips they are that they know their stuff they'll yeah. tell you about like an angry farmer who will really not appreciate you on like the on their boundary lands or they'll tell you about a good place or places where it's going to be much better for you to walk down yeah um but so besides cars and public transport one of the um our, our personal loves is we so when we tried to start making our outdoor activities more sustainable we started cycling more yes and uh, that That's just cute. opens up yeah. such a such a crazy amount of stuff the uk is one of the most cycle friendly places in the world mm -hmm. and you get might... yourself a pair of panniers you can adventure so much more so i think this our first big adventure with this and this turned out to be probably one of our hardest challenges yes. uh, was so we'd always like the we've always been interested in the idea of doing the uk three peaks challenge so hiking the tallest peak in wales england and scotland and most people try and do it in 24 hours and will drive in between which we thought didn't seem like the greenest option so we decided to take it to the bike instead yeah and but it just seemed it seemed a bit crazy to us that you would you know you're driving through north wales you're driving through the lakes you're driving into the highlands yeah. like these are like the highlights of our natural wildernesses and, and beautiful if you're areas. driving you're just whizzing past all of it whereas cycling we got to really be in the heart of these places yeah and so we turned it into a seven day challenge which was brutal. which was so hard <laughs> but it was just um it was incredible it really mm. like and the highlight i think for both of us was it wasn't like the summits it wasn't climbing the peaks it was the places in between yeah we um, did it completely unassisted so we carried our tent all of our gear all of our food camping every night it was definitely an adventure <laughs> yeah and so obviously you know you're not going to be able to do that every time say if you go on a um you know you do weekend camping or you do a weekend hike or something you probably you might not be able to cycle to a national park every weekend or mm -hmm. you know however often you go but it's just something you can think about for maybe once every few months or in the holidays you can plan instead of if you have the time turn it into one of these like human powered adventures yeah. and it's do you know what I mean uh, the possibilities for adventure and it doesn't have to be cycling either no you can walk you could walk from your front door you could if you could canoe if you got yeah, a river kayak. You, yeah there's like a whole get world of potential yeah and um obviously I, I get that cars and public transport are often the most convenient but you can think about these as like you know these special events and a real adventure yeah and it um it really inspires you as well like yeah. i think you you're spending your whole time Outside, outside and yeah. it just uh, it inspires you to protect these areas it's very good for your soul so in the planning <laughs> stages we have location and time gear food and drink transport and last but not least check so it's all well and good doing all of this planning and preparation but if you don't check that you have everything if you've not planned exactly what you're going to do then it could all just go out the window if you forget your tent once you get to the campsite yeah and well, uh, i guess for things like a tent i mean it, it does happen you can forget a tent but it's normally quite high up on your checklist <laughs> yeah but things, things like, like food. food yeah mm. so if you spent 
you know, you've tried to make your own recipes for the first time or you've bought some dehydrated meals, it's really easy to leave them on the kitchen counter. Um, and then you get to wherever you're going and you, you've not got them. You've just got to fork out for more. And, yeah. yeah, and that's, that's honestly, that's probably when it's the hardest to find sustainable options. When you're in a rush and you're just going to a supermarket, yeah. that's when you'll end up buying things which are covered in plastic wrap packaging. They're probably not going to be as nutritious. Or mm. I'm not, it's not even just food. I think if you're buying gear last minute, if you're just picking up a, you know, a pair of walking yeah. boots from an outdoor shop along the way, it's very easy to rush that. So just make sure that you're, you know, you're checking everything before you go. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing to consider is when you're on the trail. Yeah, so that's your planning. And now you're on the trail. You're, yeah. in, you're in the wild, you've got your backpack on or your bike and you're outside. <laughs> yes. Okay. So the first thing first is thinking about your camping spot. Yeah, so um, I think that the camping spot, obviously if if you go to a campsite, this for first timers going outside, this is, or not necessarily first timers, but campsites have got all the things set up for you to camp very sustainably. So it can be quite a good introductory thing if camping is quite new to you. You know, they've got like compostable toilets, mm -hmm. got recycling bins there available for you. Yeah. They've got like solar charging. Mm -hmm. with, um, it's all very helpful and accessible for you. Yes. But obviously, I'm sure. A lot of you and us, you know, we're wild, wild camping fanatics, like it is, Jimmy, it's just incredible. Um, but then you do need to be a bit more cautious about where you're camping, because mm -hmm. in the UK, obviously, it's a grey, you know, it's what, I mean, technically illegal, but a bit of a grey area. <laughs> so you've got Scotland and Dartmoor where it's, you know, where, where it's legal. And then, um, well, yeah, with, so you, you just, you need to be a bit more cautious with it. You yeah, need to we be, found if we've been respectful, then people have been okay with us sort of wild camping in places we've yeah. never had any issues and um so obviously so you need to be further away from civilization and development but that puts you into these really natural areas which is yeah. incredible it's probably what you're going for but it also means you've got to be considerate about where you're camping and although there's loads and loads of tips we can give you about actually picking a good wild camping spot in terms of comfort and not getting caught uh, in terms of sustainability the key thing you want to think about is not moving or damaging veget vegetation yeah. for your camping spot uh, and i guess also where you're camping in the planning bit if you know there's an area which is really naturally important like a um, yeah a really naturally important area mm. then you know maybe you think about somewhere going just on the outskirts where your camping is not going to cause too much damage mm -hmm. um, yeah you don't want to be damaging any vegetation sort of pulling down branches or picking up flowers in order to be camping yeah, so I think, you know, the compressions on the grass, whatever, but is if you're thinking about kind of pulling down trees or kind of clearing area to make room for your tent, problem. then is, uh, yeah, then it's not so great. And also thinking about if you're hammock camping, to be using straps rather than rope, because the rope can erode the bark on the trees, which is obviously very damaging for the trees. Yes, and bigger trees. Like if yes. you're a heavy man like me and you're going on kind of small things like this, it's going to bend in. So... Pick ones that can support your weight. Mm -hmm. So then the next thing that is probably what most people think of when they think of going camping is leave no trace. So the first thing is rubbish. So any rubbish that you take with you, just take it away with you. So any food wrapping, any organic matter as well, sort of banana peels, take all of this home and dispose of it properly. The next thing to think about is fires. So everyone, you know, everyone <laughs> loves a fire. Yeah. Well, you, you can't, you know, if you've had a long day touring or if you've been backpacking, you can't be kind of settling around a fire, pitching your tent and cooking your, your food yeah, on the tent. It's beautiful. But, but you just got to do it. Yeah, sustainably. So thinking of this is quite important to you, thinking of this in the planning stage, checking that the area that you're going to allows fires first and foremost, and then using your initiative. If it's been very, very dry, there are lots of low hanging branches, it's probably not the best time to have a fire. So yeah. just thinking a little bit is the area clear is there anything around that's going to catch a light if the fire gets out of control and if you um if you know if a fire is your priority and you're going in the middle of the summer there's um think about going for a campsite because in campsites you can have fires yes. or um you know you can have barbecues and i've seen recently i read an art, uh, article on the guardian of these almost wild camping campsites where uh, you, you virtually it is basically like wild camping and you you will find places where you're allowed to set fires so mm -hmm. if that's your priority 
Yeah, think about that. Like that. And think about that in the planning stage again, because yeah, it is beautiful at the end of the day to just sit around the fire. And um, the next thing to think about is wildlife. So as Josh said, sort of not damaging any of the local fauna or trees, but also thinking about any wildlife that lives there, not to disturb it as cute as that little squirrel may be in the tree it's probably not the best idea to get end up latched onto your neck if you go uh too close to it yeah and take a photo so just thinking about being respectful and the next thing to think about is peeing and pooing we all do it we so do we, we've got to talk about it <laughs> it's a little bit of a taboo subject if we don't like to talk about it but if you're spending a lot of time in the outdoors the urge is going to come that you need to pee and poo so just thinking about leave no trace when you are peeing and pooing so not going on the trail, thinking about not going in campsites, if you are pooing, digging a cat hole to do your business and not leaving any toilet paper or sanitary products on the floor at all, taking them away with you. So we always take this poo bag with us, which has um, compostable poo bags, toilet roll. So then we can just put the toilet roll into the little poo bags and take them away with us. It's the easiest way to do it. It's clean and it doesn't impact the environment at all and so some places might you might have to carry out so yeah you might have to take your your poop away with you so in very that, pristine areas um so for that a trowel is really you know you don't want to be trying to find sticks and twigs and things to do it it ends up into a mucky situation believe me so, so, so um, a trowel is a good yeah. investment look on the Cotswolds website they've got a bunch of different you know kind of really lightweight trowels that you can use just to take it away with you mm -hmm. And we have some articles on Leave No Trace where we're going into a lot more detail about all the different ways that you can unpick this if this is something you're a lot more interested in. So the main things for being on the trail is thinking about your camping spot and thinking about Leave No Trace. So then it comes to... But I think I realise we're talking very quickly here. Uh, do you guys have any... We've got one more part to talk to you about, about afterwards, but are there any questions you guys wanted to ask? About this section. And then we'll go on to talking about afterwards when you get back from your trip which is when the urge comes just to sort of kick back when you get home dump your stuff and leave it have a beer kick back <laughs> but it's so important to still sort of consider the yeah. environment and your green ethos at these stages we, we're talking about after mm. yeah yeah so yeah so when you get back it's um yeah i know that when i've come back from a long hard hike or a backpacking trip you know, it's so easy just to want to put your feet up. I think you just said that. Yeah, yeah. Back. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what you can do, I think, is just to do it, for, but just to make sure about unpacking your stuff. Because yeah, if you like in the UK, it's like nine times out of 10, it's quite wet and windy and muddy. So when your shoes are caked in mud, when your tent is completely soaked through, when your sleeping bag is soaked through, you know, your, your insulated jack, everything is wet and muddy. Don't just leave it in a bag for months because the next time you go to camp or you go to need it, it's, it's going to be in a sorry shape. You're going to be having to shell out money if it's ruined. Yeah, so this is a big thing. So leaving your shoes sort of caked in mud is one of the biggest ways to get rid of that waterproof membrane that's on top of them. So just banging off any of the mud and if they need it, re-waterproofing it. So when it comes to things like your airbed or if your tent, if they have holes in it, doing it now, especially with the tent. So one thing is that especially if your tent is wet when you've packed it away, just to leave it until the next time you go camping can really damage it. So airing out your tent, and then if it needs it, you can repair any holes and also re-waterproof it. The same with waterproof sort of coats or trousers. So we use Nick Wax washing. It's really easy. You can put it in the washing machine with your coat or your trousers, and it will just add some that membrane to it to keep them re-waterproof and make them last a lot longer so it'll avoid you shelling out more gear and stop your gear going to landfill yeah and if you um if you're not sure about waterproofing your stuff check out the uh van gogh have got loads of information on their website or cotswolds have got lots of information too where it will take you through the steps on how to do it and it's, it's definitely worth it because you first of all you're going to save money and yeah. second of all with a tent, you're not going to end up waking up in the middle of the night with a drip coming Which, on your forehead. Yeah, speaking uh, from experience, you do not want. No, no. <laughs> a soggy sleeping bag is not the one. And uh, I think the the last thing, so once you've done all of this, is to tell the world about it. Yeah, um, share your knowledge and know-how. Yeah, so we definitely think that the uh, the key to making you know our future more sustainable is spending more time outside, encouraging people to spend more time outside. And I think once you're out there, you realise that 
this is such an incredible thing that we need to be protecting. And I think so when you're doing these trips, tell your friends about it. Tell yeah. them that you bought this new sustainable tent. Share your tips. Um, or, you know, invite them onto trips with you. Yeah. And so that you'll teach them some of these sustainable tips and how they can um, how they can make their camping trips lower impact too. Yeah, and a little bit greener. Mm -mm. So hopefully this has given you a little bit of inspiration. And as we sort of said at the start, it's not about trying to incorporate all of these all at once because that can be a bit overwhelming. It's about doing it one by one, bit by bit, and sort of picking the ones that you think would be most manageable for you and most suitable for your trips. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so there's been a few questions that have come past. We'd like to answer. Um, so if you have any questions, shoot them at us, whatever it's about us or sustainable camping, then we can so, answer them now. Uh, are there any trade-offs when selecting sustainable equipment, e.g. any reduction in waterproofing? So nowadays we'd be uh, talking about the PFC free tents and so the, the PFC is sometimes used not just on tents but anything like waterproofing materials, so on yeah, like rucksacks, yeah, waterproof trousers, waterproof jackets and nowadays with the top brands when they're doing PFC free gear there's absolutely no trade-off at all. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so much, it's incredible, there's so much research going into sustainable outdoor gear that uh, there's no trade-off at all, really. Um, they don't cost more money. Um, the, the only thing is there is less of a selection because obviously these brands are kind of moving. Um, it's a newer technology. Yeah, so I, that's the only trade-off is the, um, is the, like, the availability. But it's, it's constantly growing. And as I say, go on to the Cotswold's Cotswold website, website mm -hmm. and you'll, you'll see dozens and dozens. You, I don't think you'll find, I don't think you'll struggle to find an item which will be suitable, suitable for your trips, really. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, have you got any tips? Just go on and your questions. Um, Read the question out. Have you got any tips on cooking without a campfire in sensitive areas like heat limbs? So I think these, if you're wild camping, you, you do have to be very careful, particularly if you're going in the summers, because we've seen, you know, in the previous summers, we've seen so many wildfires which have happened. And I think the, the main thing is only really to do it if you are very sure of your outdoor skills. So if it's your first time having fires outdoors, it's not really worth risking it doing it in heathlands during the summer. Yeah. I think so if you're aware of how to light fires responsibly, uh, not responsibly, you know, if you're aware of how to contain fires, then uh, that's, you know, go mm -hmm. ahead with it. But if you're not, then... Then the alternative is to get a camp stove. Okay, you can get so many different... This is just a little camp stove top that you can get from Van Gogh. They have triangular ones and they are so so easy so you have the, the gas and then the top which you can just screw on which we take with us and then you can also have this inside your tent if it's raining yeah just make sure to keep it uh ventilated, ventilated. because yeah. uh yes it, it's not so good for you it's a really easy way to cook in Any the outdoors um jumping josh is just going but the midges question. yeah we uh un like fortunately we've not actually experienced the wrath of midges in scotland have we no not in scotland no when we uh, did ben nevis we weren't we didn't experience midges no but we are planning a um we are planning a cycle tour through the north of scotland but it will be on the coastline and so hopefully we will also not be getting any midges yeah we have experienced them in other places of the world i think me a little bit more than Josh, I don't know if it's Sarah, something to Sarah do. is much tastier than I am, so I can't. So I tend to experience them a lot more than Josh, so I just lather on insect repellent, and I'm a bit of a stickler when it comes to having mosquito nets up. So with, if we're in the tent in the summer, I'll always have the netted door on or as you, well. Or you and can also, get the, the mesh hats as yeah, well. Yeah, and if we're hammock camping, we have a hammock that has a mosquito mesh over the top as well, which again, I'm quite militant with because I get very itchy. <laughs> Cool. So Any more questions? So yeah, thank you guys so much for joining in with us. Yeah. Um, it's been amazing talking with you and we're really glad to have been able to share some of these tips. Which uh, Yeah, so thank you to Cotswolds for having us. Yeah. And as we said, you know, any questions that you have about sustainable camping or being sustainable on, in the outdoors, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook, also on our website, veggievagabonds.com. Drop us a comment or an email. We're happy to answer any questions at all and it's really just nice to connect with like-minded people so do come and say hi yeah and if for things like uh, recipes and outdoor gear that's you know we're really passionate about that so 
we want to help you find the gear for your trip or find the food for your trip. Yeah, or so we can plan the trips. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, keep in store for later on. There's more people on the Cotswolds camping yeah, masterclass at four pm. Yeah. And yeah, happy camping once the twelfth comes around. Woo! <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. See ya.